As chairman of the National Baseball Hall of Fame, it is my honor, Mike, to welcome you into the Hall of Fame family. My father's faith in me, often greater than my own, is the single most important factor of me being inducted into this Hall of Fame. We made it, Dad. The race is over. For him to make the Hall of Fame after 1,389 other players were taken in front of him, that's not the kind of thing that's supposed to happen. This isn't the kind of career that was supposed to unfold. This isn't where it was supposed to happen. Lopez wants it away. And it's hit deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Home run by Piazza. Mike was, was the Met fans' superstar. He was a superstar before he got here. He was a superstar when he was here. For that reason, he will always be beloved. Quite simply, the greatest hitting catcher of all time, number 31, Mike Piazza. When you get embraced by them and they take you into their family, they don't, they don't do it to everybody. To share this with them, it's pretty cool. There's a ring to it. You only think of the elite of the elite when you start to ponder who's in Cooperstown and who's been inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Most of these guys were surefire, no, no doubters from the time they were high school and drafted and everything else. Piazza, you know, he was a guy who said, the only way I thought I was going to get to the Hall of Fame was if I bought a ticket to get in. Very little about Mike Piazza's story makes sense when you look at it. 62nd round pick, no real catching experience to speak of, and he makes the Hall of Fame as a catcher. Well, he's a big uh, Phillies fan. I sat right behind the dugout, and he would always watch Mike Smith, and that's where he would really, his love for baseball really came through. In his home, you know, he would do the old thing of having the uh, hitting balls in the basement, then getting the batting cage built, having Ted Williams come over. I'm going to tell you the truth. I think I hit the ball as good as he does when I was 16. Holy. Yeah, he's got a good glove. He can play any position. He can pitch. Well, you know, it's hitting is going to be his pitch. big suit. Vince was connected in many ways, you know, he was a, uh, Vince is a great success story in himself. You know, he started with a little tire store, then he went on to uh, sell cars. And he's from Norristown, PA, which is the hometown of Tommy Lasorda. Ted Williams happened to be at a local uh, signing out in Norristown area, and Vince went and basically uh, contacted him and said, hey, you invite him over for dinner, I'd love to have you come look over at my kid's swing. When you hit the ball to right field, you hit him in the air more than you do on the ground? Yes. What does that mean, that? Swing late. That's right. Ball... You know what I love most about baseball? That I felt the more that I applied myself, the more I could see myself improving. And that's what I loved about the, the sport, in the sense that when my dad gave me the batting cage and machine that I could work on it, every year I would see myself hitting the ball further, hitting the ball harder, becoming a better hitter. He looks good. You don't need to look All right, boy, let's go. <laughs> he looks so pretty. You know, he wasn't drafted out of high school, you know, because the scouting report on him was that he, you know, he was a first baseman who couldn't really play the position. Some power, but would it develop, you know, that sort of thing. And then, you know, he went through the whole college process. He had, a, you know, a sort of a lost year at Miami, played in junior college, and then finally the favor that we all hear about, which is Tommy Lasorda, you know, great Dodger great. You know, let's, let's take Mike in the... In, in, late in the draft, and it turned out to be very, very late in the draft, 62nd round. It was very difficult, and, and I was fighting a, a number of factors. Being a last round pick, you know, not signing for a lot of money because the team doesn't have a lot invested in you and, and you're, you know, disposable. Um, you know, obviously the relationship with Tommy, because 
you know, there's politics in everything. I knew I had some major league talent, but I also, also knew the gravity of the situation kind of hit me in the face, knowing how difficult the game is and how difficult it would be for me personally because I wasn't a first round pick. I knew that I had to play for survival. When he got drafted by the Dodgers, a couple of people in the organization liked him. And then he went to the Dominican, uh, worked in the Dominican Winter Leagues, really, at the academies before anyone else did. So Mike was all about working just like his father was. That's a thread throughout his career because, you know, even in the minors, you know, when he finally did get the chance to be a pro, you know, he wasn't at the top of anybody's depth chart as a catcher. You know, he started to learn that position as a professional. So he's, you know, not playing as much. And in fact, it even led him, led him to quit at one point when he was in uh, Class A ball in Vero Beach. I was struggling at the time, and I was not getting along with the manager. And uh, I wasn't having fun, you know? It was, I, and I got to the point where maybe something, something's trying to tell me something. Somebody, maybe somebody's trying to say that I just need to move on, go home finish my degree, get a job, whatever the case may be. I said to my dad, I can't do this anymore. I'm just, I, I can't, I feel like I'm wasting my time. And uh, you know, when I had left, I tell the story with Reggie Smith, you know, not only being a great hitting coach and refining my swing, but teaching me, you know, the real lesson is not to quit. And he said, hey, you know what? There's a lot of people in your corner. And if you walk away from this, you're gonna let them down. And he goes, I'm number one. He goes, I will go to bat for you because I know what you're all about. To drive to right center field by Piazza, his first major league hit. And Tyler the Sword has got to be happy along with his dad, Vince Piazza, looking on. He was the, the new generation. I mean, it's only a few years uh, after their last championship in 88 with uh, Kirk Gibson and Oral Hershiser. So the Dodgers sort of still had that expectation at that time of, of championships and kind of elite level players. And here's a guy who really soaked it in. He had power, but he was such a high average guy. There have been catchers hit home runs, even at Johnny Bench, Gary Carter, but those guys were 260, 270 hitters. Well, he was hitting in the 340s. I mean, it was just crazy with the numbers he put up when he was young. Right field, way down the line. That ball is out of here. To be a catcher with that kind of offensive production, now there were some knocks on him early about the defense, but with those kind of offensive numbers, it was like, all right, whatever. You can, you can box every ball you want if you can hit like that. Really, when things started getting difficult for him was when the O'Malley family uh, sold to Fox. Because until then, you know, it had been a, a family ownership going back to Brooklyn. And I think there was an expectation that the Dodgers kept their own. They obviously had money. They saw beyond just the field and then the importance of keeping people as Dodgers, bleeding Dodger blue, all that stuff. And then when Fox came in, it was really a strictly business operation. They had no background in running a baseball team. And uh, they were in over their head. Well, Mike was approaching free agency. He was going to be a free agent at the end of the 98 season, and it became pretty clear early in that year, in 98, that he and the Dodgers were very far apart in terms of what they were willing to pay and what he was looking for. It was a negotiation. Now, Mike obviously wanted the biggest contract in baseball, but the irony of it is that the, he and the Dodgers were stuck, I think, around the 80 million mark. Um, and right after that season, the Dodgers went and broke new ground, giving the first $100 million contract to Kevin Brown, when they could have gotten their own Mike Piazza for a lot less than that. You know, Peter O'Malley had sold the team to Fox. Um, they had come in, they didn't know anything really about running baseball, and they dug their heels in, I dug my heels in, and I think maybe, you know, we both made mistakes in a sense that it was very contentious uh, in, during the negotiations. and. Um, you know, it got to a point to where we just we, we, we just locked horns, we couldn't get it done, and they knew that there was a chance I could leave a free agency at the end of the year, so, so obviously they made the trade. It's time for Love Urban Sports, and there was word tonight of a huge trade in baseball. The biggest trade in baseball history ever in terms of names and money. Mike Piazza and Todd Zeal go from the Dodgers to Florida for Gary Sheffield, Bobby Bonilla, Charles Johnson, Jim Eisenreich, and a player to be named Lee. When we walked in to the training, we both got tapped on the shoulder, walked into the training room after the game, and saw Fred Clare standing there. Mike looked white as a ghost. 
when you talk to general managers every day, they give you a pretty good sense about their team, but this was a decision from LA that was made from an ownership level, from the Fox level above Fred Clare, the general manager. And so Fred didn't make the trade. So everybody was su surprised by it. So they made the decision at a certain point that um, they were just gonna cut bait and get what they could for him. And they traded him to the Marlins, which I, I think felt to a lot of people like an exile because at that time, um, the Marlins were not a competitive team. They had uh, broken up their team after the World Series championship the year before, and they were left with a, a hundred loss team. Wait, we got rid of all these guys and we brought in who? We brought in Mike Piazza. When I get to the ballpark, they're gonna be like, this is a joke. This is not real. I, I, you know, funny how, you know, how these things get spread. And here he is sitting at the lunch table having a sandwich. I go, no, that's freaking Mike Piazza. It was weird. It was all I can say is weird. We checked in with Dave Dombrowski the day after the deal. You know, when the dust settled a little bit, called Dave and said, you know, what's your plan? What are you doing? Because my guys all said, and my assistants and everybody in the baseball department, like, well, let's, I mean, Piazza would be great for us. He's that marquee star player. And, the, you know, as a, as a general manager, your first thought is to play devil's advocate and say, okay, well, he's a free agent at the end of the year. So if we trade for him, we better sign him. The other thing is we have Todd Hundley coming back from Tommy John surgery. We've got an all-star catcher coming back. Do we want to duplicate an area of strength? I was concerned, absolutely. I was uh, confused. I really didn't know what was going to happen. You know, Todd had a, a great fan base here and uh, some of, I remember some of his fan club was, they were very adamant uh, that Todd should be the guy. Are you willing to move? Uh, no, why would, why would you put me at first base, you know? Why would you put Piazza at first base with John Olerud over there? He's a great, uh, a great first baseman. Um, no, that, that's, that's something that, that, that bridge will be crossed when we get there. There was a lot of debate internally, and, and there was question between the two owners about, one was very reactionary, and Nelson doubled it, go get him, we'll worry about it later. And then the other one was more pragmatic, the Fred Wilpon, who, who wanted us to make sure we studied it. After all of the meetings, all of the discussions came back and said, it's probably not the best use of our resources to train our prospects to go get Mike Piazza when we have Hundley coming back. It got out in New York that we weren't going after him. I remember doing radio and saying, you know, we're, we're not going to duplicate our resources, and we were getting blasted. Mike Piazza is a very, very good player, very good offensive player, and you, at, at any point, any general manager would be stupid not to want to add that type of production to his club. For this organization and for us to be successful in the long term, we would be taking a huge risk to trade all of our prospects now to get Piazza, hoping that either he or Todd could play first base. It's safe to say that Met fans were not thrilled with what they heard because what followed was just a deluge of borderline hatred for the idea that they weren't going to go and get Piazza. At some point when you have to go from being that, that competitive team to a playoff team, you have to take a chance. We pulled in the business department, went back in with Fred uh, in my office, had him sit in a chair, and we all, I said, Fred, I'm just, we all want to make a presentation to get you to understand this. And we went through it, and Fred listened and, and everything else, and at the end of it he goes, all right, let's go for it then. Let's talk about the baseball scene in New York in the mid-90s. What did that look like? Well, I mean, it was Yankee land, 100%. Uh, I mean, all the people who had uh, kept their mouths shut during the 80s when the Mets uh, were dominant in, in town all of a sudden, you know, recalled their great Yankee love and, uh, you know, because they had these really great teams and they were winning the World Series every year. I mean, it was really, you know, the Mets were quiet team and you know once they started you know sort of late 90s to get a little bit better I mean even guys who were on those teams described themselves as a nice little team you know they were a team that in Bobby Valentine's mold at the time he liked to, he liked to have a scrappy team of overachievers he loved that he loved to be able to manage these guys but they didn't have a superstar we had a group that uh, needed to develop there's no doubt about that but we had a good core and uh, our offense uh, always needed a little help. 
What it really missed was the rock star. You know, it missed the gate attraction. It missed the bona fide slugger uh, in the middle of that lineup, and, and that's what it lacked. That's why everybody was craving for somebody like Piazza. I think there was a groundswell of public opinion in New York for the Mets to acquire Piazza from the Dodgers when it became clear that the Dodgers wanted to move him. And I think once he went to Florida, I think because of the way their franchise had been broken up, that it was clear that he was going to get traded somewhere else. You know, Dave Dombrowski is a guy that we, we had, done, had so many deals with uh, because we made the Al Leiter deal and the Dennis Cook deal earlier, and we were in on Kevin Brown. We knew every player in the organization that he liked. We knew the order in which he liked them. We knew his preferences of this guy over that guy. He liked lists, so I gave him a list of three players on list A. Preston Wilson was on list A as our young outfield phenom prospect with power and, and had all kinds of tools and everything else. I don't even remember who the other two guys were on the list. On list B was Ed Yarnell, left-handed pitcher who had pitched extremely well at AA. I think might have been the Eastern League Pitcher of the Year. On list C was Jeff Getz, who had been our first round pick. We knew that the Marlins had really liked in the draft as well. I knew that Dave would take Preston, Ed Yarnell, and, and Jeff Getz. Amongst the group that I paired them with, I knew that he would, he would take them. I called him, made the proposal. He said, all right, let me talk to my guys. He called me back and he said, okay, we'll take Preston Wilson off list A, Ed Yarnell off list B, and Jeff Getz off list C, and the deal was done. Fran Charles is live at Shea Stadium with exciting news for Mets fans. Give the Mets organization credit. They went out and grabbed one of the top superstars in the game, and they did it by sending three players, minor league outfielder Preston Wilson, minor league pitcher Ed Yarnell, and a player to be named later to the Florida Marlins for superstar Mike Piazza. You know, New York is, is, is a big city, always a rumor, you know, and when they say, well, we got a pretty good chance to get Mike Piazza, and uh, my first reaction was, uh, uh, I believe when I see it. We get into stretch, get ready to stretch. There's Colin Mike Piazza to dug out with the catching gears. And I say, oh my God, it's true. You know, hopefully my, my arrival here will make this team a, a little bit better. So that, that's all I want to do. I, I don't want to kind of make a, a, a distraction for the guys. I just, I just want to blend in and, and do what I can and, and hopefully just get into a rhythm and try and get in, in sync because there's going to definitely be an adjustment period. There's no question about it. A lot of people don't remember this. Mike did not fare particularly well his first couple of months with the Mets, and in fact, he got booed at Chase Stadium. And there was a lot of um, hand-wringing among Met fans that the fact that Mike was getting booed might dissuade him from re-signing with the Mets at the end of the year. It starts to weigh on Mike, and Bobby Valentine was reporting back to us that he was a little concerned at how Mike was reacting that was the first time that we had a little bit of a concern that might not be a place that he'd want to re-sign. Players don't take that as motivation. They take it as, as insult and shame sometimes. And, and for Mike, you know, he's like, he's trying his hardest. He wants to be a star for everybody. I'm sitting up in the box going, oh, no. If you look at him, even, you know, on the field during those times, he just, I don't remember him literally smiling a heck of a lot, you know, he was really just an adjustment process. And as we see with players that come here, I don't care who you are and what level of stardom, it, it takes a while to get used to it. Well, everything again that happened in LA, I did have a little bit of a chip, you know, I did, I did want to basically prove them in a way, you know, sort of make them feel like they made a mistake and traded me. So, you know, I was playing for a lot of different, like, energies that you know a lot of guys don't play for and I felt like that's a positive for me because you always feel for as a player you always work better when you have a little you know incentive I don't consider myself any more gifted in, in learning how to adapt but you know I adapted Wagner deals and a high fly ball deep right center this ball is It finally turned for Mike, right? He started to perform and the crowd started loving him. High fly ball to deep left field. Yeah, there it goes. Mike Piazza. We knew the relationship worked, right? Because the fans, where the booing happened early, 
they were just booing because they wanted to cheer, right? They were booing because they wanted to go nuts. And at some point it happened. There became this connection with Mike and the fan base that was pretty cool. Once Mike got hot, once he hit a few home runs, once he started being embraced by uh, the New York fandom and the media, I didn't think there was any way he was leaving. From the time the Mets acquired Piazza, they wanted to re-sign him, but, um, you know, Mike had options. He could have gone anywhere. He could have even gone back to Los Angeles. We had an idea that he had turned down seven years at 84 million, so we knew we probably had to be north of that to get a deal. I make a proposal, I, I wanna say it was, you know, just beyond the 84 million that he had been offered. They kind of looked at me and they kind of smiled and said, Steve, come on. Uh, what had happened was, there was an interview uh, with Nelson Doubleday, uh, and Nelson had said in the interview that, you know, we might look at somewhere around 93 million to get a deal done, you know, in that range. So it was out there. So when I went in between 84 million, just beyond 84, but not at 93, they looked at me and said, Steve, seriously? And I said, all right. They said, all right, let, let us call and talk to, to Mike. And, get, and so I, you know, I got a cup of coffee and just sat in their offices and they came back and said, all right, we got a deal. So I'm like, if they are serious, we'll know it. And um, they were. And I felt like they they made the move, they stepped up and uh, and and gave me, you know, put, put their faith in me. Now I have to embrace it and, and try to perform. After missing the 1998 postseason by a single game, the New York Mets reported to spring training with a purpose, to end their 10-year absence from the playoffs. Well, 1999 was a magical year for the Mets. I, I know they didn't make it to the World Series that year, but in many ways, from my experience, it's one of the most enjoyable years I've ever spent as a Mets broadcaster and as a fan. They had something special that year, come from behind victories, and Mike was front and center. Fly ball, deep right field, this baby's over, Mets win, Mets win, Mike Piazza with a home run off of Trevor Huffman. He was the star power guy. He was the billboard player. There, there's no question about that. He was the one that the fans related to the most, that they adored the most. And Piazza hits one in the air to deep left field. Back on the warning track, back at the bullpen fence, and it's out of here! Mike Piazza with his fourth home run off Roger Clemens. He was one of the best guys to be around in the clubhouse. I think he really enjoyed talking to the writers, and not just about baseball. He was kind of a big Civil War buff. He talked a lot about you know, he was a big historian. He liked talking history. Obviously, his love for heavy metal. I remember hearing him on the radio, you know, as a guest DJ, and that's something, you know, being on there and talking about uh, heavy metal. You don't really see, you know, big stars doing that, some, that sort of thing, which is why he was kind of a perfect guy for New York, too, because he was interested in other things. I always called him my co-host because he was part of the show. He wasn't just there to be interviewed. I never interviewed Mike. He was, he was my co-host. He'd pick records, he'd talk to the callers. It was a really pretty interesting, unique thing. And it hasn't really happened since. I think as the season went on and as the fans bought into what Mike, how Mike was performing, that almost like overnight flipped the switch. We were drawing 50,000, 45,000 a night. It was, pretty, it was a pretty exciting time at Shea. With he and John Olerud and Edgardo Alfonso, they formed a tremendous core for a team that really didn't have a lot of other offensive pieces and, you know, made it to the sixth game of the league championship series. The 3-2 pitch. Bring on the Yankees. That was, that was frustrating. I was depressed for a while, you know, because I felt, I truly felt like if we would have won game six, we would have won game seven. There's no way we would have lost game seven. We would have just steamrolled them. I don't know if people know this, but Piazza got in a car and drove 
from Atlanta back to Los Angeles by himself with just the devastation of what happened in 99 and the loss and how it all happened and, and you know, taking responsibility for it and feeling like he let people down. And, and, and he had so much pain from that. And I think there was a part of what happened in 99 that for Mike was a big part of what he hoped could take it to the next step in 2000. The pitch to Piazza, swing and a drive, deep down the left field line, toward the corner, it's out of here! Out of here! Mike Piazza with a line drive, three run homer. The Mets have tied a club record with a 10 run inning. And this place is absolute bedlam here at Shea. I, I felt that we were coming together. Um, you know, we had changed. Obviously, Johnny went, you know, to Seattle, and, and we made a few changes. And I think we would all freely admit we weren't the best team. But I think at that time, we were, as far as talent-wise, but we were playing extremely well together. Benitez ready, the one-two pitch. Swing and a miss, he struck him out. The Mets have clinched the wild card. And for the first time in franchise history, the Mets are going to the postseason for the second consecutive year. You know, the one thing we knew going into the playoffs, we didn't fare real well against the Braves. And there was a part of us thinking, you know, we're going to go out there, we're going to do our thing. We start and sit playing against the Giants. And all along thinking, you know, if we can avoid Atlanta, it sure would be nice. To center, Peyton. And Bobby Jones has done it. A one-hit shutout. A masterpiece. And the Mets have defeated the Giants. And they are heading for St. Louis. Forget it. Hallelujah. Thank God I didn't have to face Chipper Jones. And the, and the Cardinals were good. You know, they were a good club. The fact that it was the Cardinals, it was kind of refreshing. Like, we don't have to face the Braves. Hampton with a count of three and one. For the first time since 1986, the Mets are going to the World Series. Talking about the Braves, you know, the, the rivalry that we had against the Yankees was, was just as intense, obviously, more in some respects. Way inside and hit him. Piazza is hit by the pitch ball and he is down on his back in the batter's box. Oh man, was that scary. Boy, nobody wants to see this. The Met fans absolutely felt like it was personal, not just because it was the Yankees, but it was because it was their superstar. All of a sudden, the team that you hate with an incredible passion is seemingly trying to take your guy out. All I know is that it seemed as though every time Mike had a chance to face Clemens, that he beat him. Obviously, that built up in Roger for whatever reason. He decided to come inside and ended up beating Mike, which was one of the most awful things I've ever seen. What happened in the World Series that year is completely unexplainable. Here's the one-two pitch. Broken bat foul ball off the right side, and the barrel of the bat came out to Clemens, and he picks it up and throws it back, and Piazza's walking out toward the mound, and they are being separated. Now the benches are emptying. I don't know what Clemens had in mind. If we would have fought, and I got thrown out of the game, uh, and my spot comes up in the ninth with two runners on, and the guy who pinch hit for me or went in the game for me didn't come through, it would have been a whole different story. People would have said, oh, Piazza's selfish. Why did he hit him? Why did he do this? Why did he do that? It cost the team a game. So that was what it was. Piazza gets into one to center. Back is Brian Williams, a three-piece. The New York Yankees. Well, that's probably one of the bigger disappointments, you know, in my career. Was I, I truly felt like we were going to win that World Series, and, and I think we made mistakes. You still look back with some fondness because of the fact of what we accomplished, but uh, it was uh, frustrating. It was a special magic there amongst that team that everything sort of fell into place to make the run to the World Series. So you felt like, okay, they might be able to do it again. They were still a factor the next couple of years. Um, 2001, they went on a tremendous run leading up to 9-11, and, um, you know, 9-11 changed the whole view of the way that year is remembered. I, 
I distinctly remember when I f heard the first note of bagpipes because, you know, after I heard that, I started to lose it and I had to pray. I mean, I prayed to God. I said, Lord, please give me the strength to get through this night. The players really took on a level of responsibility and, and they wanted to do something special. The game was setting up to where we needed something big. Lopez wants it away. And it's hit deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Cobra by Piazza. And the Mets lead three to two. For a city to rally around a player like that, I mean, that's kind of like a once in a generation type of thing. Who doesn't watch that home run by Mike Piazza and get chills? I don't care if you watch it a hundred times or a thousand times. Every time you watch it, your eyes are glued to it. And Mike is the central figure to that. No, no player, I don't care how long of a career they've had, is so linked to a moment or a city like Piazza is with that 9-11 home run. He was as, as big a part of New York baseball as anybody. And I think the way that home run has been remembered over the years, the fact that it seems to grow in stature and significance annually would support that. I mean, I want to get emotional again, but to have it with me there on my plaque for eternity is, it's, it's, it's overwhelming, you know? And, and I think, um, as I said, I've always tried to let people put that in perspective. And for me, I just, as much as I hit the home run, I do feel like that there was, it, it just wasn't me. So the fact that everyone was involved in that week is on the plaque with me is really special. one pitch and Piazza drives one in the air in a deep right center field. Back goes Tucker looking up and it's out of here! Mike Piazza has now hit more home runs than any catcher in the history of Major League Baseball. Sometimes in professional sports you feel like it's time. And I think when it came to Mike at that point, it was time. You sort of felt like, oh, if we're going to move forward, I think we need to start that rebuilding phase. And he was beloved. I mean, he wore down like any catcher would eventually. Uh, yeah, he did still put up some pretty good numbers, but then it got to the point, the throwing became more of an, or, more of an issue. As the offense, always, it's about the offense for the most part. When the offense starts to decline a little bit, all of a sudden, those defensive flaws become more noticeable conversation you know really I had to I had to broach it with him about moving to first I mean this is home run king for catchers doesn't want to leave the position he understood the the logic of it I don't think he was happy about it I've always had this innate ability to really look at things with humility and I knew the team was changing I knew you know Willie was coming in uh, Omar was there they all wanted you know and when a general manager comes in he wants to put his own spin on the team you know, he doesn't want to deal with someone else's leftovers. I wanted to be wanted. I think maybe it goes back to the Dodger days. But, you know, since that really didn't happen, I felt like it's time to move on. We're here with a start in L.A. and he brought a start in New York. Petrello says he's okay, and Piazza hits one out of sight. Second of the night for Piazza. That's his welcome home. That was one of the most memorable nights I ever spent at Chase Stadium because, you know, here was Pedro who was you know, such an important figure in his own right, and here was Mike who was the conquering hero coming back, and the stadium just, it, there was such an outpouring of love for Mike that night that was almost incomprehensible. 
that moment to come back and to be cheered by the fans, I mean, as a, an opposing player, they were saying after a home run, even the guys that have played for a team for a specific time never got that reception. It was just, you know, the affection that I have gotten from these fans has just been something so special. Handling the steroid era as a voter, trying to make proper decisions, correct decisions as a voter on those players is the single most difficult thing I've had with the Hall of Fame balloting. Trying to determine whether a player is a Hall of Famer, it's a big responsibility. It's a hard thing to do. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. I was not surprised that Mike Piazza did not get in right away. The Hall of Fame induction class of 2014 has just been announced. Mike Piazza does not make it. What do you make of him not getting it? I think that too is predictable. I think this goes back to the suspicions about the PEDs and uh, you know, I think his percentage will, will go higher this year and I think he will get in eventually. And when people used to ask me before he came up for the vote, I, I said no doubt he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's the greatest hitting catcher of his generation. There, there wasn't a doubt in my mind that would happen. Lo and behold, it didn't shake out that way. The Baseball Hall of Fame announcement which is going on right now. Smoltz, Biggio, Pedro, Randy Johnson. That is it, just those four guys. Mike Piazza does not make it. Let's face it, the, the PED suspicion was the big contributing factor to that. Fair or not, that's the world that we live in these days when it comes to covering baseball and voting on things like the Hall of Fame. It surprised me. I heard the rumors and I talked to people in the game when he was playing and then when he was out of the game that they made the case that Yes, this is a guy that used steroids. Now, I, nobody that I talked to could give me enough proof that I could say, well, that's, that's it, it's a shut and close case. I sat next to Mike Piazza for seven years. I know him well. I've been out, dinners, hanging out, teammate stuff, right? I, you know, other than a big guy, like, I, I, I never saw anything. It was all based on, hmm? you know, that. And that, I think, is unfair. I'd always run into Vince or get a call from Vince, and, and Vince would take it personally. So, so you know, if Vince, if, if the dad is taking it personally, you know that affects the son. As time went on, he was becoming frustrated. That's where we're different. You know, I'm a little bit more like, Dad, I go, Dad, you know, my work is done. There's nothing I can do. And I've always been respectful of the process. I've seen some players who were getting close and weren't getting voted in, and they became bitter, and they became frustrated and they were saying things that I thought were like not appropriate. And I said, I don't wanna be that guy. I will always love this game. You know, whether I never got into the hall, ever, it, it, I would never ever become bitter and say, you know, I got robbed and, because, you know, again, it's one thing for us to play, but it's another thing for the, the, the writers and the critics and the people to, to embrace what we have done. When I retired, I, you know, you can't another, hit another home run, you can't hit another base hit, you can't, you can't, it's done. And so I always had this sense of peace about it. From Norristown, Pennsylvania, drafted in 1988 in the 62nd round, the 1390th pick overall. Today, he calls Cooperstown home. Mike Piazza, welcome to the Hall of Fame. Well, it's uh, it's a great honor. And, um, looking forward to seeing you uh, seeing you tomorrow. It's uh, something that I've always you know loved about this game is the history, and you guys just do an amazing job up there. As chairman of the National Baseball Hall of Fame, it is my honor, Mike, to welcome you into the Hall of Fame family. For me, being a traditionalist and a student of the game and knowing what the hall represents, you have sort of an unofficial theme and of your speech, and for me it was that you do not go in alone. You know, I think about Reggie, you know, convincing me to come back. There's always a handful of people in your life who change the direction of your destiny. Reggie was this for me. You are a great hitting coach, 
but the biggest lesson that you taught me was how to get through the game of life and to never quit. I think about, obviously, my father, you know, working with me as a kid. My father's faith in me, often greater than my own, is the single most important factor of me being inducted into this Hall of Fame. We made it, Dad. The race is over. You know, his dad had a real bad stroke a few years ago and m was so instrumental in his playing baseball that I think it would have been a real shame if Mike would have finally been inducted and God forbid something happened to his dad. I, I lost, forget about tearing up, I lost it. It was, it, it was so heartfelt and resonated with, I think, anybody who's a father who gets it or has a father and had that relationship, to sit there and watch your boy get inducted after all that, you know, it's taken place. Oh my God, I, I, I full blown cry. Yeah, yeah. How can I put my, into words, my thanks, love, and appreciation for New York Mets fans? You have given me the greatest gift and have graciously taken me into your family. Looking out today at all the incredible sea of blue and orange brings back the greatest time of my life. Because of everything that they have gone through in their in the life of being a Mets fan, from the inception of the team and the frustrations and the Miracle Mets. And, you know, I go back and I watch the Miracle Mets and I get emotional, you know, from Jill H Gil Hodges' wife going, this is, it's wonderful, darling, you know, with the beehive hair and the, it's, it's, it's great. Because when you get embraced by them and, and they take you into their family, they don't, they don't do it to everybody. City Field for tonight's salute to a newly enshrined member of Major League Baseball's most exclusive club, the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Our honoree will also be the final Met in history to ever wear uniform number 31. You have to be pretty special to have that number retired and I think you could make the case that there are others that could have been but there is no other that is the slam dunk that retiring Mike Piazza's number is. Quite simply the greatest hitting catcher of all time Mike Piazza. The number retirement that we are about to witness is a big deal. It is quite simply the highest honor that a team can bestow upon one of its players. Please direct your attention to the Mets retired numbers atop City Field in the left field corner. Congratulations, Mike. City Field is all yours. Thank you. He was a Ruthian figure for, for this franchise. They like the larger-than-life characters, and, and, and that's what Mike was, I think, to this fan base. In a time that really wasn't overly successful, too, he was the guy that they kind of clung to. Thank you.
guys are unbelievable. This guy gave it, and he was their guy, and he was their star. It's really two of your players in the history of a fran your franchise that started in 1962? What? Of course they love you. The unofficial theme of my speech was that no one goes into the Hall of Fame alone. Each and every one of you is in there with me. Thank you. For him to make the Hall of Fame after 1,389 other players were taken in front of him, that's not the kind of thing that's supposed to happen. This isn't the kind of career that was supposed to unfold. This isn't where it was supposed to happen, but it happened, and that's part of what makes baseball beautiful. And I tell these guys over here and those guys over there, enjoy your career. It goes by way too quickly. He really cared about the fans in New York, and, and he felt proud to be a Met. So to have that number retired on the, on the wall, I mean, that's got to be one of the most special things. It's his life story. I want to reach back and say a special thanks to Steve Phillips for making the trade to bring me to New York. I always used to joke, I, I traded for him, I will never trade him. I would never have been the general manager to trade him. I only wanted to be known as that guy who brought him to New York, not the guy that, that let him go away from New York because he meant that much. He's the guy. I mean, Seaver's the guy and Piazza's the guy. Thank you. God bless you guys. I want to say just a little bit of what it means to have my number retired for this great franchise and for you amazing fans. That means I will always be with you. He's the greatest offensive catcher in the history of the game, and you could make a case that he's the greatest offensive player that the Mets have ever had. And the other piece to that is that Mike always had a great sense of the moment. He was a superstar before he got here. He was a superstar when he was here. For that reason, he will always be beloved. Every time these guys are down and you need a little bit of inspiration, just give a little peek up there to old Mikey. And know that I'm back home watching you guys on TV. Saying a lot of prayers, praying for the Mets. You have given me an honor that no man deserves and no player deserves. And I think about all that we went through and all we lived through from the beginning to the end. God bless you guys. God bless your families. And let's go! It's your pitch. To feel that emotion for me is, uh, it's just natural again. It's, 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 it's overwhelming. And it represents everything that has encompassed me as a ball player from having to work. And that's what these people know. And that's why they come here. And um, so, you know, to share this with them and to know that for years when I come here with Marco, it's, per it's pretty cool. 